This is the second lecture in this series on hemostasis and will be part one of a description of normal physiology, which will focus on primary hemostasis. The learning objectives of this video will be first to describe normal endothelial function as relevant to hemostasis and the endothelium's reaction in response to vascular injury. Next, to describe the formation and structure of platelets. And last, most of the video will focus on the list of triggers and consequences of platelet activation. I'm showing this overview of hemostasis again just to orient you in that I'll be focusing this video on this part, including the role of collagen, von Willebrand factor, and fibrinogen on platelet activation and their aggregation into a platelet plug. What do the endothelial cells, which normally line blood vessels, do in the absence of vessel injury in order to prevent inappropriate thrombosis? First, they secrete prostacyclin, which for a reason that will be explained in a few minutes, is usually abbreviated PGI2. Prostacyclin inhibits platelet activation and aggregation. They also secrete nitric oxide, which locally vasodilates and also inhibits platelet activation and aggregation. They express a molecule called heparin sulfate, which activates an enzyme called antithrombin, which inactivates several members of the coagulation cascade. They express thrombomodulin, which changes the enzyme thrombin's affinity away from activation of proclotting factors and towards activation of anticoagulant factors. And last, endothelial cells normally express a protein called tissue factor pathway inhibitor, which inhibits the tissue factor 7A, 10A complex. Heparin, antithrombin, thrombomodulin, thrombin, and the tissue factor 7A, 10A complex will all be discussed in the next video. In addition to these normal functions of the endothelium, which prevent spontaneous thrombosis, the normal laminar flow of blood through the vessels typically results in a layer of cell-free plasma immediately adjacent to the endothelium preventing platelets from making physical contact with endothelial cells, which could have the potential to trigger activation. The earliest response to vascular injury is vasospasm, which essentially occurs instantaneously. Vasospasm is short-lived, however, and most relevant in minor injuries of smaller vessels. While the vasospasm of endothelial cells following injury is important, Platelets have a much more important and complex role. I'll first discuss where platelets come from and what their structure is like. Platelets come from megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes are large cells produced in the bone marrow, largely under stimulation from the hormone thrombopoietin. Here's a path slide from a bone marrow biopsy in which two megakaryocytes are seen near the middle. Over 1,000 platelets are formed from the cytoplasmic fragments of a mature megakaryocyte. One third of the platelets in the body are sequestered in the spleen, and this splenic platelet pool freely exchanges with the platelets in circulation. Normal platelet lifespan is about 10 days. In this peripheral blood smear, the many lavender circles with central clearing are the biconcave discs of red blood cells. The two larger cells with a multi-lobed dark purple nuclei are white blood cells, and the tiny purple dots that are spread around among the other cells are the platelets. You can appreciate that they are much smaller than the other cells. Since they are cytoplasmic remnants, platelets lack a nucleus and have relatively few traditional organelles such as mitochondria and ribosomes. However, their cytoskeleton and membrane structures are highly complex. The details of the platelet cytoskeleton are beyond the scope of this course, but there are other structures of which you should be aware. For example, platelets contain unique cytoplasmic structures called alpha and dense granules. These granules contain various compounds involved in platelet adhesion, activation, and aggregation, as well as the coagulation cascade. Platelets also have many different types of membrane glycoprotein receptors, of which there are debatably four particularly important ones. There is the GP1B59 complex, which binds to the multimeric protein von Willebrand factor after it has been immobilized on exposed collagen. GP1A2A, also called integrin alpha-2-beta-1, 
binds to exposed collagen directly, as does GP6. And a receptor called GP2B3A, also called integrin alpha-2B-beta-3, binds to free fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor. If you're wondering about the confusing nomenclatures for these receptors, the GP system, which stands for glycoprotein, designates numbers and letters to proteins according to their electrophoretic mobility on polyacrylamide gels. The integrin nomenclature is based on the protein structure. Unfortunately, neither of these are remotely helpful in understanding or remembering their functions. The normal response of platelets to vascular injury is dependent upon something called von Willebrand factor. This is a large circulating glycoprotein that is produced by platelets in endothelial cells and which has key roles in both platelet adhesion and aggregation, as well as in coagulation. Von Willebrand factor exists as a heterogeneous mixture of multimers of various sizes, which are linked by disulfide bridges. Smaller multimers are constitutively secreted by endothelial cells and megakaryocytes, while larger multimers are stored in endothelial cells within structures called Weibel-Pilade bodies and in platelets within structures called the alpha granules. The larger multimers have greater activity than the smaller ones. Von Willebrand factor also plays a role in the coagulation cascade, in which it binds to circulating factor 8, greatly increasing its half-life. The von Willebrand factor protein contains many different binding sites, including ones for collagen, GP1B, GP2B3A, factor 8, and heparin. The largest multimers are broken down by an enzyme called ADAMS13, an acronym which stands for a disintegrin and metalloproteinase with a thrombospondin type 1 motif, member 13, that must be one of the most ridiculous enzyme names in the body. The enzyme is important, however, because reduced activity can lead to a life-threatening condition called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP, in which patients develop microscopic blood clots throughout the body. TTP will be discussed in a later video. Interestingly, patients with type O blood have lower levels of von Willebrand factor compared to other blood types, which may be related to the observations that patients with type O blood may be slightly more prone to bleeding complications, and patients with non O blood groups may have slightly higher rates of heart disease and venous thromboembolism. As platelets travel in the circulation, they exist in an inactivated state. Inactivated platelets are non-sticky, so to speak, and do not actively secrete compounds into the blood that promote hemostasis. So what are the triggers for activation in which platelets transition from a relatively quiet antithrombotic state to one that is prothrombotic? There are four primary compounds that trigger platelet activation, each of which uses one or more specific receptors. The trigger for the first wave of platelets to be activated is subendothelial collagen, which is exposed to the blood following vascular injury. ADP is another trigger, which is actively secreted out of activated platelets in an autocrine and paracrine fashion. This means that it acts only very locally, in which an activated platelet that secreted ADP can have its activation further enhanced by ADP binding to itself, or ADP can activate inactivated platelets in the immediate vicinity. Thromboxane A2 is a compound that diffuses out of activated platelets and can also act in either an autocrine or paracrine fashion. Finally, thrombin, an enzyme which itself is activated from the coagulation cascade, can activate platelets as well. So just in the last several minutes, I've mentioned a lot of different receptors, proteins, and other factors, and you may be starting to lose track of what each of these things is responsible for. To help synthesize all this information into a cohesive picture of how the individual components of platelet activation fit together, let me walk you through a, a brief animation. So here's a blood vessel wall with red blood cells flowing past the endothelium. Beneath the endothelium is the subendothelial matrix and a layer of collagen fibers. Now be aware this is not to scale. Now let's suppose that the endothelium is damaged somehow, exposing the blood to the subendothelial collagen. Although there is a lot of overlap in the chronology of the steps of platelet activation, conceptually you might consider platelet adhesion as being the first step. Von Willebrand factor that is either circulating in the blood 
or which is released by endothelial cells, binds to the collagen. Local turbulence in the flow of blood brings inactivated platelets close enough to the site of injury that the GP1B59 receptor complex binds to the immobilized von Willebrand factor. Other platelets will rely on the GP6 or GP1A2A receptors to bind directly to the collagen, and any of these can activate the platelets. Activated platelets begin secreting the contents of their alpha granules, which include fibrinogen, more von Willebrand factor, and a member of the coagulation cascade called factor V. They also secrete the contents of the dense granules, which most importantly includes ADP. Activated platelets will also start to generate thromboxane A2, which diffuses directly through the cell membrane. At this point, aggregation starts to occur. This is dependent upon platelet activation triggering a conformational change in the GP2B3A receptor from an inactive to active state. Now fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor can function as bridges between the GP2B3A receptors on neighboring activated platelets. As platelets start to aggregate, more pro-hemostatic compounds are secreted, activating more platelets, leading to more aggregation, and before long, an enormous bunch of platelets are stuck together in what is referred to as the platelet plug. In addition to the aforementioned consequences of activation, two more are critically important. First, platelets change shape when activated. In response to an activation-triggered increase in intracellular calcium, rearrangements of the internal cytoskeleton causes their normal discoid shape to transform into a highly irregular morphology with numerous projections of cytoplasm sticking out in all directions. Here's an electron micrograph of the three major types of blood cells. On the left is the biconcave disc of a red blood cell. On the right is the round, irregularly surfaced white blood cell. And in the middle is the highly irregular form of an activated platelet. This shape change increases the platelet surface area and increases their ability to physically interlock with and adhere to neighboring platelets. One final important consequence of platelet activation is the surface expression of a phospholipid called phosphatidylserine. The concentration of negative charges from the phosphatidylserine on the surface of the outer plasma membrane supports assembly of clotting factor complexes to be discussed in the next video. Because the mechanism and consequence of platelet activation is difficult to remember, I'm going to run through it one more time using a different diagram with some additional details about the platelet receptors involved. Once again, after vascular injury, subendothelial collagen becomes exposed. The GP6 and GP1A2A receptors bind to this directly, and the GP1B59 receptor complex binds to collagen via von Willebrand factor. The process by which platelets initially become stuck to exposed collagen is platelet adhesion. The act of platelet adhesion to collagen can itself lead to platelet activation. Platelet activation can also be triggered by thrombin, which is formed from the coagulation cascade and which binds to the PAR1 receptor. It can be triggered by thromboxane A2, which binds to the thromboxane A2 receptor. And it can be triggered by ADP, which binds to the P2Y1 and P2Y12 receptors. Each of these receptors is important because they are potential drug targets, some of which are used by drugs already on the market, and some of which are being investigated. Consequences of platelet activation include secretion of granules, which release ADP, more von Willebrand factor, and fibrinogen. Platelet activation also leads to their shape change, and it leads to activation of the GP2B3A receptor. Activation of this receptor allows it to bind fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor, which aid it by the shape change results in platelet aggregation. The consequence of significant platelet aggregation is the formation of the platelet plug. The last topic I'll discuss in this video is the synthesis and regulation of thromboxane A2 which is important in understanding the mechanism of action of aspirin. Thromboxane A2 is an example of an eicosanoid. These are an important and diverse group of 20-carbon 
polyunsaturated fatty acids. Other important members in this group include arachidonic acid and prostacyclin. The synthesis of eicosanoids is very complicated, and unless you are concurrently enrolled in a graduate level biochemistry course, you should not bother memorizing this chart. However, there are a couple of specific details important enough to remember. The first is that prostacyclin synthase is more active in the endothelium, and the consequences of its product, prostacyclin, is that platelets are inhibited and there is vasodilation. Conversely, thromboxane synthase is more active in platelets, and the actions of thromboxane A2 are to activate platelets that we've, as we've already mentioned, and also to cause vasoconstriction. So there is physiologic antagonism in the body between those two enzymes. Normally, prostacyclin predominates until platelets become activated, at which time a greater proportion of prostaglandin H2 gets converted to thromboxane. The final detail from this chart to remember is the actions of and distinctions between a cyclooxygenase or COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. While both of these enzymes work to convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2 via a multi-step pathway, the expression of these enzymes differs. COX-1 is constitutively expressed in most tissues, while COX-2 displays an inducible expression in response to inflammation. This gives rise to the category of medications called COX-2 inhibitors, which are thought to be more selective to areas of inflammation and thus carry fewer side effects. The world's most common anti-hemostatic medication is, of course, aspirin, which is a COX-1 inhibitor. Aspirin will be discussed more in the fifth video on antiplatelet medications. That concludes part one of the normal physiology of hemostasis. Part two will focus on the coagulation cascade in fibrinolysis.